was a kid. Um, we always, I guess, loved to laugh. Always loved comedians and uh, either reading it or hearing about it. I remember as a kid, uh, any of the uh, uh, gray-haired saints remember the uh, Red Skelton show? Sure, that was a mainstay at our house. He was a comedian back in the dark ages before uh, internet and such things. Uh, and as I grew older, and obviously now he's uh, kind of a tarnished figure, but back in those days, uh, when I was in uh, probably older grade school and junior high, Bill Cosby was um, at his uh, peak, and uh, it was a badge of honor with my buddies if you could memorize all of his routines and uh, with all the wording and everything. So we, uh, we enjoyed that. So this morning, um, we're talking about laughing at God. I don't know about you, but I was taught, my mother uh, pounded into me a number of things, and lovingly, of course, but pounded them in nonetheless. I remember I had a buddy in school, such a good buddy, I can't remember his name now, but that's been about, <laughs> never mind how many years ago, but I remember he was in a car accident, and he had some obvious uh, physical scars uh, from that accident, and uh, he was over at our home quite often, and my parents always treated him very, very well, so they did all my friends. But I remember um, my mother not even having to tell me, you can laugh at comedians and laugh at stuff. You can even laugh with people, You're, but never laughing at somebody. That was always kind of a bad thing. I just tried to grab, incidentally, it's interesting, you know, as I put together messages, um, I always try to, to look on the internet and find some, a, a cartoon or an image or something like that that'll illustrate what I'm trying to talk about. When I'm trying to talk about laughter, do you know I couldn't hardly find a cartoon to do that? Or the cartoons I saw were, um, shall we say, <laughs> not appropriate for Sunday morning worship. So uh, this is kind of the best I can do. I like this little guy. I love his face. I love his smile. I love this little guy's smile too. I don't know if he's smiling or barking or getting ready to attack the mailman or I don't know what he's doing, but uh, a kind of a kind of a uh, laughing nonetheless. And of course the minion. I'm not a minion fan, but the movie's out making a gabillion dollars for something that looks like a Twinkie with uh, uh, sweatpants on. Anyway, there's one. One of my favorite. Got to get, uh, got to get those guys in there as well. This morning we're going to talk about a situation, and we're continuing our series on uh, Christian characters with character. And uh, this month we're in the book of Abraham, or in the story of uh, Abraham and Genesis, and looking at his life. We talked about Abraham a little last week with last time with the uh, geriatric gospel. This time we're going to be looking at Sarah and her laughing at God. Genesis 18, uh, verse 9. Um, uh, angels are appearing to, to Abraham and says, Where is your wife Sarah? They asked, uh, There, in the tent, he said. One of them said, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, need to insert a little quick historical things you may remember from last time, but uh, I can't remember my sermons from two weeks ago, so maybe I don't expect you to remember me either. But uh, Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah's in her 90s. All right, so we can cut her a little bit of slack here. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son in a year. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. And Sarah and Abraham were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Yeah, good there. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, how will I now have this pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard 
for the Lord. I want you to focus on that phrase. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And of course the answer to that rhetorical question is no, there isn't anything too hard for the Lord. He said, I'll return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for your love and your grace in our lives. Speak to us today as we hear through your spirit, shared by your word and shared by your humble servant, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Part of, I think we can maybe cut Sarah a little bit of slack here. She's in her 90s, and I've been in a number of nursing homes over the years, you know, visiting people. I have never seen a delivery room in a nursing home. Just never have seen that, all right? And we laugh because that's just kind of an absurd thought. But with God, all things are impossible. All things are possible, excuse me, before you slip here. Um, according to world records, a lady by the name of Dawn Brook is recognized as the oldest woman to have ever given birth. Uh, she was 58 when she got pregnant. Imagine that was an interesting doctor's appointment. And uh, she was 59 when she gave birth. And so if you think about it, when her child enters the first grade, she will be getting social security. So that seems a little bit weird. We can think that Sarah's uh, situation is also kind of weird as well. But now we remember as we look through, you look through the, uh, the first chapter of Matthew and the third chapter of Luke, you look at the genealogies and you trace down through the Jewish heritage that Abraham, through his lineage, comes Jesus Christ. Also a pretty miraculous birth if we remember the uh, Christmas story. And so the, the phrase that we keep coming back to is that nothing is impossible with God. It may seem outlandish, it may seem a little crazy sometimes, but God, with God all things are, you know, with all things God are, God, things are possible. You see, God didn't reprimand Abraham for laughing because he laughed because of astonishment. It was just like, wow. Um, we saw this the other night. Um, one of the shows we enjoy watching in the summer is the uh, $100,000 Pyramid. Anybody watch that? It's kind of a fun show and uh, give away money. And there are two rounds of the game. So a contestant has two chances uh, to win some money. If they win the 50000 then they can come back again and win the 100000 But even if they don't do that, they can still get that fifty. There's also a little contest game within the game where the contestant can win a really great tri tri uh, trip. Well, the other night we were watching in this, uh, and I, I'm one of these kind of people that I kind of like to see every, everybody win a little something. Well, this, uh, this one girl, she didn't get the uh, first victory, she didn't win the trip, I was kind of rooting for her to uh, win that second round, and it came right up to the final second and the final thing that she had to try to guess, and she did that. And what was so interesting is that she starts just getting excited, and she was so astonished and so surprised, there's tears running down her eyes. So we understand that. Something like that, you might even cry when you're uh, astonished. And we see the same thing here with Abraham and Sarah. Um, Sarah, on the other hand, laughed because of her lack of faith and her doubting. She was more focused on circumstance, her age, than to trust in the fact that God is all-powerful. 
She was trying to tell the all-knowing God that she didn't sin, that she didn't laugh, that she didn't doubt God. And she trying to explain to the all-knowing God, our all-knowing God, that she didn't sin. And it just reminds me of, you know, a little bit earlier in Genesis where Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and then they found out they were naked and they're trying to hide from God, which still is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Number one, how do you A, hide from God when there's only a population of two in the world? It's not like you get lost in the crowd, okay? It's just you and Adam out there, I guess that's where the phrase came, and forgotten everybody, okay? <laughs> there weren't that many yeah, anybody's in, uh, in that age. But we also, you know, we remember the story in Axa with Ananias and Sapphira, who um, they were collecting money, you know, for the church, and people came in, and uh, they would say, maybe I sold a piece of land, and here it is, want to help things out here, because they were feeding a lot of people who were displaced because of the, uh, of the Romans. Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of land, but then lied about how much that that was a part of their normal giving. And because of that, they got struck dead. Not because of the amount, but because they lied to God. And I don't know about you, but it just seems like a stupid thing to do. Here's a phrase I want us to think about. Say it with me. For nothing will be impossible with God. This is in the first chapter of Luke, and this is talking all about, uh, John the Baptist talking all about the, uh, the miraculous birth of Jesus, and John's birth was uh, pretty miraculous too because his mother was advanced in age. And this is what the angel is saying to them, saying, say it one more time with me, for nothing will be impossible with God. I was reminded of an old hymn, Johnny and I didn't lead it this morning, but uh, as I, maybe you've heard this. The words are, do you got any rivers that you think are in, uncrossable? Got any mountains that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He can do what no other power can do. And, you know, I, there's just, you know, events in our lives over these last weeks, and I know in your lives too, people facing uh, surgery and sickness and and uh, difficulties, some things may seem impossible, some things may seem improbable, some things may seem very, very difficult. But notice the promise, for nothing will be impossible with God. I think the Gaithers had a song, I like the lyric, it said, with God and I, we make a majority. And I like that, because he's the one that gives us that kind of power and gives us that kind of strength. We can cross rivers and tunnel through mountains because God goes ahead of us and makes that impossible path suddenly very, very, not only possible, but easy to travel through. Jesus said, come unto me who are heavy burden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so you think we don't, maybe don't use yokes as much or the tractors, but two oxen would be pulling a very heavy load or a cart or out in the field with a harvest. The yoke would be put on both oxen and both together uh, could pull what one couldn't pull uh, by themselves. That's the yoke we take upon us. That's what we, we give to God. He comes alongside of us and he is walking and carrying any burden that we might happen to need. Um, we can walk through the valley of sh uh, death because we know God's with us. God's power is manifested in strength and his glory. And that will get us through. 
I was reading this story. It's kind of a cute story. I liked it. Um, Dr. Frank Harrington is a senior minister of one of the largest Presbyterian churches in the nation. And every uh, Easter season, he and his wife would um, arrange to have a massive cross placed on the front lawn of the church. This thing was several feet high, you could see it from everywhere. And uh, it was uh, covered in purple before Easter. And then on Easter Sunday, they made arrangements with uh, local florists to have it uh, adorned with uh, beautiful, beautiful flowers. Well, one day one of the city buses came by and the driver was not only new to driving the bus, but the driver was also new to the route and to the community. He'd never seen the church, he didn't know anything about it, but he was driving the city bus uh, there, he's chatting with one of the passengers, and all of a sudden he sees this huge cross. He slams on the brakes, just about propels everybody out of their chairs, and he just looks at it and says, wow, somebody really big must have died. <laughs> he was right, wasn't he? But he didn't have the complete story. Because not only did Jesus die, but he rose from the dead. And he came back, and he lives in us today. And so we may look at situations in our life and maybe just chuckle at their just absurdity about how unsolvable they may be. But we need to remember that with God, everything is possible. I just reverse that a little bit. Read that again with me. For nothing will be impossible with God. So maybe you're facing the impossible or maybe the improbable today. Uh, maybe uh, health crisis, financial crisis. Maybe the loss of a loved one. Maybe uh, struggles at work or at home or with family or and of course, if you're like uh, many of us, though, maybe three or four of those kind of pile on top of each other at uh, one time. And it seems a little, little overbearing. For nothing will be impossible with God. Without God, no, can't get through it at all. With God, he walks with us and walks uh, beside us. As we come to our time of invitation this morning, we're going to be leading the song... He touched me, shackled by a heavy burden, burden beneath a load of care. Then the hand of Jesus touched me. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this wonderful song.